sveiki. Iš kart noriu pereit prie anglų kalbos. Hello, excellences, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, students. Uh, we are here today to hear and discuss matters of international development. I am uh, glad and honored to introduce our guest, uh, who is uh, the chair of uh, OECD Committee of uh, Development Assistance. That's the, the, the correct title. Uh, Mr. Eric Solheim, who is an experienced uh, Norwegian politician, if I may say so, he has been uh, a member Thank you. <laughs> a member of uh, the parliament, uh, Norwegian parliament, uh, for some time, active in party politics, uh, and also, which is probably the most important period uh, of your experience connected to today's talk, a minister of environment and international development uh, for, for a number of years. Uh, uh, and has been participating in different uh, countries, developing countries, solving uh, conflicts and, and I issues of development there. And as I said, is currently working for OECD. OECD in Lithuania generally attracts more attention due to the process of accession of Lithuania to this so-called rich country club, but uh, uh, development issues uh, uh, clearly are also important and they are of course especially important from Nordic countries perspective that's how Nordic countries uh, are seen in other parts of the world as the leaders of uh, assistance not just in terms of money uh, allocated but also attention given on political agenda so I won't take up more of uh, your time, uh, but before giving a floor to our guest, I just would like to announce that after his introductory talk and uh, discussion that I hope will follow and you will be active and use this opportunity, uh, we will have short coffee break after which there will be a discussion on Lithuania's membership in OECD. So you are all also invited to this discussion and I should also probably mention that uh, this event is part of Kapuscinski lecture series which uh, are organized uh, in cooperation with uh, European Commission, United Nations. Uh, am I missing anything, Vilo? Okay, you can see here. <laughs> Just uh, to be appropriate and correct. <laughs> So, uh, Mr. Sohim, the floor is yours. Is this working? Yeah. Oh, very good. Uh, if you cannot hear me or if you cannot understand me, please tell me. I have to admit I still speak English with a very heavy Norwegian accent. My children are all the time cor uh, correcting me and telling me the right way to pronounce the English language. So if, if you don't understand me, you tell me and I'll try to speak a little bit uh, slower. Uh, we are here to celebrate one man, Richard Kopczynski, Polish, born in the city of Pinsk, which is today, as far as I know, in Belarus, dying in Warsaw. Uh, but I think we, we should celebrate him in really trying to look into what are the lessons learned from his lifetime. What were his achievements and how can they enlighten our discussion here today. And let me suggest a few. Hi, <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> As Norwegian ambassador and we all Norwegians know each other, <laughs> know each other very well. Uh, I mean, what, what can we learn from Kapuczynski? He was to me a true European intellectual. That means a man or woman who is absolutely curious, not destroyed by some preset ideology or preset views, but looking into the world and trying to understand it as it is. 
he was for that reason, of course, opposed to the destroying intellectual ideas of the time, then Nazism, the fascism, and communism, which destroyed our thinking, but absolutely curious, trying to learn what is the real condition of this world. He was maybe very remarkably, for a Pole of his age, a world citizen. Most Poles were not allowed to go around in the world. He went everywhere. He went to, the, to Iran at the time of the Shah, he went to Ethiopia, he went to India, he went to Afghanistan. It's much, much easier to name the places where he did not go than where he, go, where he did go. So he was an intellectual in the sense, open to everything in the world. And he was, maybe even more importantly, true intellectual in the sense that he took sides. He took sides with the ordinary man, the people, on, the people suffering, against leaders, autocrats, emperors, whoever they were. And if we, on this basis, we want to take side, uh, we want to be true world citizens, and we want to be curious. If we look around in the world in the year of 2015, what do we see? And the surprise is that very contrary to what nearly everyone believes on the planet, the world has never been a better place. We are the most lucky generation living on the planet Earth. The average human being is much taller, much fatter, and basically for good, much better educated, and in much better health, and living much more in peace than any other generation in human history. When you watch TV, most people watch TV, they get exactly the opposite impression that we're living in a particularly violent time where most people are poor. Uh, just in the last 10 years, we have reduced the number of people on the planet dying from malaria, one of the big killers, to half in 10 years. Just in the last two decades, we have reduced the number of children dying before age five to the half. That is saving every year more children on the planet than the entire population of the state of Lithuania. Well, maybe small, you may consider yourself small from a global perspective, but that's a huge amount of human life children saved. The, uh, the number of extreme poor on the planet is also halved in the last two decades, and it's an enormous progress. If you are born on planet Earth today, on average you can expect to be 70 years. A little bit more in Lithuania. A little bit more also in China and Indonesia and Vietnam and a huge number of previously very poor nations. Uh, a little bit less in Africa. But we forget to compare that to what was the reality of the past. 200 years back in year 1800, not one nation on the planet, the richest nation on the planet in year 1800 was the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, life expectancy was close to 40 years the richest place on the planet. When I was born, and well, it's a long time back, but that's not that old, the average life expectancy on the planet was 46 years old. So, I mean, to put, cut it very short, from Adam and Eve, when life expectancy on the planet was probably in the 30s, we do not know that for sure, until Winston Churchill, it, was, it went up from 30s to 46, since Winston Churchill has gone up to 70 years, since the uh, 1950s absolute miraculous progress and no other generation on the planet has experienced anything like this. And then you will say, I mean, maybe that, well, we are not doing well on violence. The con absolute country is also the case there. Uh, in Europe, for instance, the chance of being murdered is about one twentieth of the chance of being murdered if you go 200 years back. That applies to being murdered by your husband, I mean, it's not so often you're murdered by your wife, or being murdered by someone in the streets, or being murdered uh, by war. Whatever violent death is rapidly declining. Women tend to believe that there is more rape. Consider the following. Up to very recently, you won't in world literature anywhere find rape described from a women perspective. Rape was a sin, it was illegal, but not because it was negative for the woman, but, but because you made some mistake to her husband or to her father. If we go to the Old Testament, uh, God of a God of a Christian God, 100 times demand of the Israelis that they should kill more. 
they have in many cases been so bad from God's perspective that they are letting women and children go rather than killing them when they've occupied the city. And God tells them, no, 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 this is a mistake. Moses tells them, please go and kill more. Why was that? Well, I mean, could be because our God is particularly violent. But since I'm a Christian, I prefer the other theory. This was how wars were fought those days. The reason why we react so rightly, negatively to these crazy guys of the ISIS uh, in uh, Syria and uh, Iraq is not that what they do is unthought of in human history. It's fortunate that so few people are doing this. A couple of hundred years back, this was entertainment on every square in Europe. Torturing people to death was entertainment. Killing Jesus Christ was entertainment in Jerusalem in year 33, but killing anyone else in Europe was entertainment until very recently. Fortunately, very, very few human beings today would want to see others be tortured uh, to death. So, it's enormous progress. And if there's progress, it's very, very important to identify why it's progress. I mean, let me also give you one caveat. That's very important. For sure, saying that on average we are doing better on the planet because it's no consolation for the mother in southern Sudan who saw her children being killed by violence or saw her children dying from, uh, from uh, uh, diseases which are completely curable or know that her children have no chance of education. Just in south Sudan there's one out of 100 children who get into nine years of education. It's an absolute disaster. For her, the average message will not uh, help her. And we going there saying her that on average we are doing much better because it was just much better in Lithuania, in China, in Norway, basically everywhere, will not help her. So for this reason, we need to bring everyone on board. But why, I mean, why do we have this progress? Because if we can identify the reasons, we are much more likely to have more of it, to bring everyone on board uh, in prosperity. And I may, let me identify five main reasons why we are so basically successful. Number one, we have much better states. You need a strong state to develop, not a brutal dictatorial state, but a strong state to frame the market, to set the rules, to direct the development. Let me propose a success story here. In uh, 1960, a young man called Lee Kuan Yew uh, became the Prime Minister of Singapore. Uh, at that time, the average Singaporean made 450 US dollars a year. When last month, Lee Kuan Yew, at the uh, uh, age of close to 90, went back to God, the average Singaporeans made 55,000 US dollars a year. In many ways, so reckoning, the richest nation on the planet has gone from one of the poorest nations, an absolute slum with a lot of in, uh, malaria and other problems, into the richest nation uh, in one long generation. Why? Basically for just one reason. And you may argue Singapore is just a small city. Well, the population is uh, substantially larger than the population of Lithuania. So it's not that, not that. I mean, probably pro approximately the population of Lithuania and Latvia uh, combined. So it's not that small. Small from Chinese perspective, but fairly substantial from a Lithuanian or Norwegian perspective. Why have they been so successful? By and large because this man and his group of people were able to make all the political decisions right. They didn't have more money than anyone else, didn't have a better starting point. Most of the people in Singapore were uneducated those days, but they made the right political decision and they created a state which was bringing people to development. So we need to assist the state formation. There's no way African nations can really prosper unless they have functioning states, like you have, for instance, Second, you need market-based economy. Uh, for very, very long, many people doing development believed in, uh, if not communism, at least they believed in some sort of collective decisions in, in, uh, rather than market. That debate we should now put at the historical graveyard. We, you need a market-based economy. No other econ for, uh, economic formation is effective enough. But you need a state to frame that market, to protect people against the negative sides of the market, for sure, all that. 
that you need a market-based economy. And again, if you want an example, what's the difference between North and South Korea? Language, same. Religion, same. People, same. History, same. Raw materials, much more in the North than in the South. The only real difference between the absolute prosperous people of South Korea and the absolute destitute people living in dictatorship in North is that South Koreans basically got the political decisions right and provided a market-based economy rather than the economy of the North. I mean, South Korea is now probably the most successful nation on the planet if you compare to where they were in the 1950s. The average South Koreans, if you won't believe it, are 390 times richer than they were in the 1950s. Uh, and I don't know, I haven't watched the car park here, but I will not be surprised if there are a number of Hyundai cars in Lithuania and that quite a few people here are using Samsung uh, mobile phones. And many of you may even have tapped into the new cultural expression uh, coming from uh, South Korea, the m biggest hit ever on YouTube, Gangnam Style. M I, my son has seen it for uh, at least uh, five or ten, ten, ten times. Uh, but it's an enormous achievement from a nation like uh, South Korea. So state and market-based economy. Then you need to prioritize education. Because if you want a prospering economy, if you want to climb up, become, become more affluent, you must, you must, must, must emphasize economy. Today, the OECD has made a list of all 70 nations on the planet who has joined the PISA, uh, PISA monitoring system and listing them from the best to the worst. All the best are Asian. Singapore is number one in education in the world. Second is Hong Kong, third is South Korea, fourth is Japan, and you can continue with uh, the same. All the Asian nations have prioritized education, and you won't believe it, poor Vietnam, still a very poor nation, are now doing better in school for their 15-year-olds than we do in Norway, one of the richest and we would think one of the most successful nations on the, on the planet. So they must do something right because they spend much less money on education than we uh, do. I mean, isn't that right, Doug? Uh, so uh, focus on education is key and you must focus on education even at a time when you cannot afford to do everything else. Also, if you look to China, they have prioritized education, they have not prioritized health. This is not to say that health is not important, but they said we will do education first, and that's so important for everything else in society. And for education is also important for health. I mean, health is also important for education, but health education is so important for health because a more educated population will get fewer diseases and will be more... Uh, amendable to information, etc., etc. So that's the third, uh, if you want to develop fast education. Fourth is peace. If you do civil wars, if you have massive conflicts in society, it's very, very hard to develop. Uh, the African Development Bank has tried to, uh, tried to stipulate the cost of a civil war in Africa. They say it's about 30 years of development. I mean, for sure, the worst is that many people are killed. But the economic cost of a civil war in Somalia, in Central African Republic, in Mali, wherever it may be, is 30 years of development. In some cases, it's even much worse when the first female president of Africa, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, took office in Liberia. The average GDP of Liberia was 15% of what it was in 1980. I mean, think of situation here in Lithuania, if you were to go back to 15% of the economic uh, uh, prosperity you do have, that's an enormous change and it takes many, many decades just to recover to the former uh, situation. So avoiding civil wars, even if it implies some compromises, even if it may uh, need to accommodate some rulers you don't necessarily like, still it may be worth taking the cost because the cost of war is so astronomical for development. It keeps people poor. You can't build a school because the school you build will be burned down tomorrow. 
Uh, you can't educate a teacher because the teacher you educate today may be killed uh, tomorrow. No one will invest private or public capital if there is war. And finally, adding to state formation, market-based e economy, focus on education, focus on peace, I will add you need also to protect the environment. Because if you destroy the environment, you will make the situation for the poor much, much worse. They are normally those most directly dependent on nature. If you destroy that nature, the poor will suffer most. I mean, everyone will suffer, and the plant will suffer. Also, normally, middle class and rich people will suffer, but the poor will suffer the most. Here, there is a mixed picture, as we have been tremendously successful on development. We have not been so successful on the environment. Still, many of the practices which brings development are destructive to environment, and we cannot continue with that. However, also here, there are some light in the end of the tunnel. But besides just Brazil, Brazil decided to reduce the deforestation rate in the Amazon. Amazon is the biggest rainforest on the planet, most beautiful, fantastic place. 50% of the biodiversity of the planet are in the rainforest. It's, I mean, zooming with life, with butterflies, with insects. I mean, we don't like them necessarily all, but they're all there. It's so green, it's so beautiful. They decided, let's try to reduce the deforestation rate, and they've reduced it with 80% in 10 years. That's the biggest service to the environment by any nation. There are positives, many other places, but no singular nation has done any service to the environment. Brazil has done with this uh, reduced deforestation uh, rate. I can elaborate a lot more, but le let me leave it with this. We basically now know how to develop. 50 years back, we didn't know, because 50 years back, it was just a few nations in Western Europe, United States, America, maybe Japan, who had developed. Now, huge parts of the plant has developed, so we know what works and what do not work. Uh, some disputes are over. In the past, some people on the extreme right said, we can do without the state. That was the so-called Washington Consensus of the World Bank and some other institutions in the 1980s. We don't really need a state. We do let, we, if we leave everything to the market, it will work well. Well, all those nations have been successful, didn't buy that idea. Singapore, China, South Korea, Turkey, Brazil, all the successful nations said, no, we don't advise, we don't take that advice, it's wrong. Until very recently also, for sure, quite a lot of people on the, on the left, communists, but also quite a lot of economists believing in the so-called dependence theories. They said private investment is a force for bad. We should not have private investment because it's sucking money from the very poor. Well, we now know that you need more private investment. All the big success stories, I mean, the Chinas, the Koreas, the Turkeys, the Brazils, the Singapores, have had a huge amount of private investment. That's part of the success story. So we, these, some of these debates are over, because if you don't open your eyes in the way Kapuczynski did, if you don't try to see the world, you will fail. If you have uh, an ideological view of the world, where you don't look into the realities, you will fail. And the reality is, the idea of the communism is wrong. The idea of the market liberalism, the two ML ideologies, market liberalism and Marxism and Leninism, they have both, they have both failed. And the successful nations are those who have learned from experience. Lee Kuan Yew, authoritarian leader of Singapore, was John once asked, what is the ideology of Singapore? And they said, I mean, for sure it's not communism, nor is it socialism, nor is it liberalism, nor is conservatism. We have one ideology here, pragmatism. If we see something going well and working, we do more of it. If we see something failing, we do less of it and try to correct the mistake and try to, try to do something else. That has served Singapore well, and I think this is not to say that you don't know, you, you also need directions, you need where to go, you need moral compasses, you need all that. But on that basis, you should look for what, what works and not being confined with old style ideologies. Then we will make a better world. On the basis that you get the policies right, which is my main message here, you 
also need to mobilize the resources. Money is not the most important for development. Politics is the most important. But how can we mobilize still the resources so that we can reach out and el absolute eliminate, eradicate absolute poverty by 2030? It's for sure possible. We know how to do it. It's a matter of the political will to achieve it. But how can we mobilize the resources? There are three main resources for development, and we speak somewhat on all three. It's aid, it's private investment, and it's tax. Some people try to construct some contradiction between the three, forget it. We need more and better aid, more and better private investment, and more and better tax systems at the same, same time. On aid, aid has served the planet well. It has been a main source for progress let me just give you one example. One of the reasons why we have reduced uh, the rate of child dying, uh, children dying so much is because of aid. Bill Gates and a number of other people made very innovative systems making certain that children are vaccinated. Today, more than 80% of all children on the planet are vaccinating against all the big killers. And of course, remember that that also protects some of the others because if 80% are vaccinated, it's much less likely for the rest who are not vaccinated to get a disease because it's not, so, so to say, in your uh, environment. So it's an enormous success story and only possible through aid, his, Bill Gates, private capital, but matched by official development assistance from many other nations. So there can be no doubt we need more and better aid. We can use aid for leveraging private investment on many other topics, but we need more of it and we need to target it more to the very poor nations. I will challenge Lithuania, you can do better on this. For sure you will argue, and at least a lot of people here will argue that there are still poor people uh, in Lithuania. Well, there are no, there are, as far as I know, there are no people in Lithuania poor in the African sense. Meaning that you have no idea what you will eat tomorrow that there's no chance of getting education to your children, that you will die from diseases which are completely curable for no money. Uh, if you can survive the disease at a cost of, say, a dollar a day, uh, um, uh, you will normally survive in Lithuania, but you may still die in the Central African Republic uh, or, uh, or South Sudan. So we are not speaking about exactly the same poverty, and we need to make resources through aid available for the uh, poorest nations. But there is a wider story here. Some nations have, have really stepped up and provided more development assistance. And let me cite a couple of them. The United Kingdom, very surprisingly, under conservative Prime Minister David Cameron, decided that we will provide 0.7 of our GDP for development assistance. And they did it. For sure, I can tell you, it was not popular with every beer drinker in the pubs of Glasgow to do that. But the political will tri tri triumphed, and Cameron did it. Why, and another example is Turkey. Turkey is a middle-income country, uh, not much richer than Lithuania, I think. And Turkey is now above the average for the rich nations in the world when it comes to development assistance at 0.45 of its GDP for development assistance. At the same time, Turkey has received 1.7 million Syrian refugees, which is not a small number. I mean, it's a bigger nation for sure, but it's not a small number. So and what is what the, the common issue between Tur Turkey and uh, United Kingdom is that they're not just providing development assistance because they want to show solidarity with the world poor, but they see it as part of their own foreign policy, their own way of protecting the next generations of Turks or, United, or, or Brits. Why? Well, I mean, if you want to keep any nation on the planet safe today, you cannot do it in isolation. Only a more prosperous world can keep us all, uh, uh, all happy and all prosperous. Your business needs markets. Those markets cannot come domestically alone. You need global markets. Then you need free trade. You need a more prosperous world that will serve also Lithuania better. Terrorism will normally not originate in Vilnius and Kaunas, but terrorism will come to the world from some of the poorest places where there are most conflict and spread to other places. Climate destruction, again, will also hit the world poor the most. 
huge, huge refugee uh, flows, which we see now, and where the European Union is discussing whether there should be some quota for every nation, which will make a quota also for Lith Lithuania. Uh, all these are destructive to the global system, and they can only be handled by making all nations more prosperous. If I want to defend my daughter's future life, if she uh, are able to live a normal life, she will die around 2100, and the main threats to her are not coming from Norway. But they may come to Norway from any other place in the world through terrorism, climate change, uh, uh, flows of refugees, nuclear wars, whatever. And only a wide perspective on the world can defend us against all this. And that's the thinking of David Cameron. That's the thinking of the president of the Turkey, Mr. Erdogan. That's why they have stepped up. That's why I think also Lithuania, time has come for you uh, to gradually step up. Second, uh, private investment is much, much, much bigger than aid. Just to compare the figures, I know there are too many figures here, but development aid in the world last year was 135 billion US dollars from the OECD nations, add China and a few others, 150 billion US dollars, 150. And the expected private investment in the world last year was 20,000 billion. So compare these two figures, 20,000 with 150. So you see that development assistance is only a small flow. It can leverage private investment, it can blend with private investment, it can take some of the risk with private investment, it can be more directed to the very poor. But the big issue is how to make the private investment of this world much greener, much more climate friendly, and much more directed to those really in need to the poor parts of the world. So we must use um, aid to achieve this bigger aim of influencing the private investment. That's why we're setting up a huge number of instruments, and I'll come back to that, to try to see how we can, how we can achieve, uh, achieve that uh, aim. And thirdly, contrary to, I mean, I was in Riga uh, at the opening of the European Year of Development, which is, we saw there. All the hotshots of the European Union were there and spoke about development. And they spoke very well. But to me, they made one mistake. They spoke as if, by and large, it's Europe which is providing development to the world. But can anyone think what, what percentage of education in the world is provided by development aid or by Europe? I would think, if I looked into it, it's approximately 1%. The rest of 99% of education in Africa, Latin America, India, China, is provided for by the taxpayers of those nations. You pay taxes in Turkey or in Brazil or even in Pakistan and India, and you get some kind of education as a return. So if we can improve the tax systems of the poor nations, again, a lot more money will be available for development than we can provide through aid. We have figured out that if you get just 1% increased tax revenue in the developing nations on the planet, that's double all official development assistance. So again, there's huge, huge money here for education, for health, for road building, rail building, whatever it may be. And at the same time, we should remove all which is wrong. Many nations are subsidizing fossil fuels rather than prioritizing education. You won't believe it until very recently at Indonesia, a brilliant, fantastic nation, one of my real favorite nations, they spent more money subsidizing fossil fuels than they spent on education and health combined. What's that? Subsidizing the car owners rather than subsidizing the schools. Now they have changed. And again, that's the amount of money made available just by the finance minister of Indonesia to that is more than the official development aid of Norway, Sweden and Denmark combined. And these are three of the main providers of development assistance in the world and not our aid to Indonesia, but our aid to the entire world, just by decision in Indonesia. Okay, let, let me summarize. For the first time in human history, we know how to defeat poverty. If the great leaders of the past, I mean, your great kings of Lithuania in the Middle, middle Ages, or Caesar or August in Rome, or the great Ch Chinese emperors, if any of them had thought of eradicating poverty, 
I mean, they didn't. They never thought of that. But they assumed that they had. Uh, they would not have known how to do it, not have known what policies to apply, and for sure they would not have had the resources those days. Even if they distributed the resources used for all the beautiful churches of Vilnius, which were for sure huge, if they distributed all of them to all the poor farmers those days, still they would have been very limited for, for everyone. Now we know how to do it, and we have the policy, uh, and we have the money to do it. So just a matter of the political will to get it done, to mobilize more taxes, mobilize better <coughs> policies, mobilize private investment and aid, and then we can achieve this aid aim. Let me end up with probably my favorite politician of all times, because he brought moral clarity, which is crucial for leadership. That's the American president, Abraham Lincoln. He was pragmatic in all decisions, but for the great aims which were morally clear. He once said, uh, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. And we need exactly the same moral clarity now. If extreme abrupt poverty, where you see your child, ch children die for diseases which are completely curable, where you don't know what to eat tomorrow, we do not get any education, if that is not wrong in the 21st century, then nothing is wrong. Thank you. When uh, the state is completely failed, it's nearly always because of civil wars or conflicts or, I mean, really um, uh, destruction, that, that kind of destruction. I mean, the places on the planet where there is really no states are the states uh, the war. I mean, the Yemens, the Syrias, uh, the Central African Republics, the Somalias of the world. Uh, in all these places, to me, the number one priority must always be to try to establish peace. Uh, because everything else you do would have huge difficulties unless you get peace. For sure, it's meaningful to educate the children of Syrian refugees or Central African refugees, uh, for sure. And for sure, you can do some, some interventions. But unless you get peace and on that basis gradually establish a state, you will have huge difficulties. Uh, I've spent quite a lot of time the last 15 years on different peace processes. I was the chief negotiator in the Sri Lankan peace process. And of course, Sri Lanka today, uh, let, me, let me compare it to Singapore. In Lee Kuan Yew's autobiography, Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Singapore, he speaks about how much he admired Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is an island, 20 million people close to, close to India. He really admired Sri Lanka, this beautiful island, green, uh, democratic, everything. Uh, at that time, Sri Lanka was richer than Singapore. Then they came into the civil war. Now the average GDP in Singapore is 20 times the average GDP uh, of Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka is not an incredibly poor nation, but it shows the, and that happened because of the war. So to create peace must be the priority. Peace is absolutely essential. Fortunately, we now have basically peace on the entire American continent. There's peace basically in the entire southern part of Africa and there's peace basically all over Eastern, uh, East Asia. But there is a belt of conflict from Afghanistan through the Middle East 
and through the Sahel part of Africa, over to Mali and Guinea-Bissau, where there are many conflict zones. And we must do our utmost to bring peace first, and on that basis, gradually support establishment of states. In the meantime, we can support humanitarian efforts, NGOs can do a lot to make life a little better. But at the end, without peace, it won't work. Uh, yeah, I just uh, catch one sentence that you said, more taxes. Yeah, like the first thing in my head was like, uh, how would you convince the taxpayers to pay more taxes in the countries, for example, in Eastern Europe? Uh, what would you say to encourage the taxpayers? Because, well, logically thinking in European Union, it's the, how to say, uh, people who, when you're going to ask, a, when you go to political campaigns and everything, you're not going to say we're going to raise taxes for more development. That's how usually you lose the supporters and electorate. What would be your suggestion how to improve the situation? What would you say to those people who critique the whole thing, especially in this economical struggle? Okay, we live in the best century and life ever that has ever existed, but still people complain. That what would be your suggestion to the situation? Thank you. When, when people find it very difficult to pay taxes is normally because they feel that they get nothing back from the state. If people get, be, believe that they get good services, uh, quality education, good health system, functioning police, all the services provided of, of a state, paying taxes is not so difficult. I mean, true, I mean, every, say, German or Norwegian would want to avoid paying taxes if we can. Uh, but every German also basically believes that you get a lot from the state, so it's not so hard to pay taxes. If you look, make the European comparison between, say, Greece and, uh, and Germany, uh, we will agree in one second what is the most successful of the two states. Uh, the Greeks may be nicer human beings than the Germans, and may, the islands there may be more beautiful than Germany, that's another matter, but what's the most successful state? In Germany, people are paying taxes, and they're getting a lot back from the state. In Greece, people are not paying taxes and they believe that they get nothing from the state. So you must get from these vicious circles where people try to avoid any sort of taxes because they don't get anything into the opposite. And if you look to the level of nations in the world, the average now for OECD nations is about 33% of the GDP for tax. The average for the uh, middle income countries is about 20%. And the average for the low income countries is about 11%. So improving the tax revenue is the is core issue to provide better education, health, etc., etc. But it's a kind of a contract. The state must also be, de deliver. But if people ta pay taxes, they also tend to demand more from the state, which they should. You mentioned that development still comes at the cost to environment and that private investment could be made greener. Uh, what would you mention as a ways to do it? How could it be done? I mean, for sure, I mean, environmental markets must be defined by states. I mean, state must frame markets in such a way that uh, private companies cannot destroy markets. But then you added, you need the power of civil society and media, and they should name and shame and they should name and praise. Uh, tra traditionally, civil society is naming and shaming. I mean, the Greenpeace or the, or they are naming and shaming. They should also start naming and praising. That means tell the world when a company is behaving poorly, but also tell the world when a company is pr pr performing uh, successfully. Let me offer one, one example, because I've been very much, as I said, involved with Indonesian affairs and with the conservation of the rainforest in Indonesia. In 2013, for the first time, it seems that the forestation in Indonesia went substantially down and all indications are it continue to go down. Why is that? That is because some people and the, the government demanded that business should stop destroying the forest. Organizations like Greenpeace shamed those companies who behaved poorly. But also many people spoke to the companies and discussed with them how they could behave better. 
and now the, nearly all the big private sector companies in Indonesia have made a decision, they have said, we will not anymore base our systems on destruction of the rainforest. There are plenty of land where we can do palm oil, which is the main uh, product. We can do it on land which is already destroyed. There is no need to cut down trees to produce palm oil, which is sold all over Europe and the world. Uh, and in, I mean, if you go to a supermarket here, for sure there will be palm oil in a number of the products, and that palm oil will come from Indonesia, Malaysia, and other, uh, other, other parts of the world. And this has changed because the business leaders, I mean, they, as everyone else, want, they are not better or worse than the rest here, or better or worse than politicians. The business leaders, by and large, want to do good, well to the world. But they need the pressure as politicians and everyone else to do it, and they need to get the credit if they do something well. Let's buy more products for those companies who do well, and let's shame those companies who don't, uh, don't do well. And with these uh, relatively simple mechanisms, I think we, we will achieve uh, a, a lot more credit to the good companies, and uh, the opposite, those companies who do not behave well will have a problem in the market. Besides one other, I mean, Vilmar is an Indonesian company, 45% of the uh, Asian market for palm oil, I've made a firm decision, no more deforestation. European companies, Unilever, uh, they have said that every aspect of Unilever's uh, global operation, I mean, this is one of the biggest companies in the world, should pass a sustainability test by 2020. That's a remarkable demand for your own business. No state, I mean the state of Lithuania or no other state has done anything like that, saying that every aspect of your state should pass such a test. And they will do it, and of course then it will be open to the media, to civil society, to everyone, to look into whether they are doing uh, what they say, put the pressure on themselves, but it will also create a much, much greener company, and through that a much greener global economy. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, I especially like that you single out these essential premises. Strong state, market economy, education, peace, and environmental policies. I fully agree with these premises, but also uh, one has to mention, for example, theories by Chamoglu and Robinson, Douglas North, and so quite recent uh, and popular theories that single out as the main premise, uh, open political institutions, uh, inclusive political institutions, in other words, uh, democratic state, democratic institutions, and so on. So, getting back to your argument about these premises, uh, you still emphasize only this strong state. So, in case it is a, is a, a third, okay, let's take a case of some kind of um, a country in Africa, which is not democratic, a state is also a, a weak, so still you say that uh, one has to put attention only on building up the state, only state institutions, but not paying attention to democratic reforms as such. Uh, is a case of Singapore is exemplary, or we should follow another path? This is among the most difficult of all the issues in the field of development as I see it. I mean, a number of states are inclusive, but not necessarily democratic. I mean, we tend to use them as the same. Singapore is very clearly an inclusive state, uh, however, not necessarily democratic. South Korea developed out of poverty with an authoritarian right-wing uh, di dictatorship. At those days, I was very much opposed to, to that dictatorship. I advocated that we should boycott it. I was clearly wrong. It was a precondition from the present situation in, in Korea, which is dem dem democracy, development, prosperity, everything. And gradually, Korea moved from dictatorship into something in between and into until a full-fledged uh, uh, democracy. Problem with demanding immediate uh, elections, for instance, in many African nations, is that it tends to turn immediately ethnic. There is no ideolo ideology. Uh, there is, no, I mean, most in, in Europe, nearly all political parties have been defined by left or right at the political spectrum. And you have conservative parties and you have labor parties. I mean, that has been the tendency in Europe. You have no African state whatsoever where there is any politics of the left-right uh, left type. 
politics in Africa immediately turned tribal in the sense that you, you, I mean, you are a politician, you want votes, how can you get it? Well, I speak about my tribe or my religion or my part of the country and it's divisive. Give you one example, Kenya, which is one of the most, have, have some of the best elections in Africa. I mean, every, every vote is counted in the right way. Last election was very limited violence. But 98% of all Kikuyus in uh, uh, Kenya voted for the present uh, president, Mr. Kenyatta. 99% of all Luos voted for his opponent, Mr. Odinga. And when you have these kind of divisive politics, I mean, you will have the same in here if 99% of all people in Kaunas were voting for one party and 98% of, of all people in Vilnius were voting for another party. Democratic discourse rather than include. So I think the issue in Africa is how to provide gradual democratization, gradual movement towards inclusive politics, for sure, avoid all the brutal dictatorship which are killing off people. Uh, but, it, it, you, but the demand which all the time comes from us in the West have elections tomorrow. Forget that the elections is not good unless they are also inclusive. Many African nations have democracy without inclusiveness. In many Asian nations, you have inclusiveness without proper elections. And China is for sure also a very inclusive state, but not a democratic uh, state. Any more questions? Uh, to, uh, we had two days trainings for local media. And uh, I understand that you came uh, with the negotiations to to enter OECD as Lithuania to, to become a member of OECD. So uh, we we have in our national media some uh, our leaders' messages of becoming a member of OECD, but it was never ever in relation to development. Uh, the period accession to the EU, we also never ever heard of our obligations to development. So, could you share a uh, 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 message for regional media? What will be Lithuania's obligations when uh, we be OECD member and, and the potential DAC member? Uh, the obligations to become a member of DOC, which is the clo club of the donors, Development Assistance Committee, where, where I'm the chair, is very simple. I mean, you, ne you need to have a development program, which you do have. Uh, you need to have an institution, could be a part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or it could be an, an independent institution who is running that program. And you need to open up for kind of inspection or peer reviews or evaluations. Uh, where other nations can look into what you are doing and you can look into what other nations are doing. Lithuania uh, took part in the peer review of Ireland uh, and for that matter you could look into what they were doing but you must also open up for the same uh, process uh, here. So those are the obligations and they are easy to meet. Uh, you can meet them tomorrow. You will be welcomed in tomorrow if you uh, decide to join. I mean I will be very very happy uh, to, to let you in. Uh, for sure, on that basis, we will encourage you to do more. We will encourage Lithuania to step up and spend more money on development assistance. That's the encouragement we do give to all our members, and we'll do that with you as well. I'm going and speaking with the governments all over Europe, trying, asking them to do more. But I will add that development uh, is, as I started with, not just about money. You need to provide money also, but it's also about providing experience. And let me suggest a couple of areas, I mean, there may be many more, where you have experience which others would be interested in. You have had a very successful transformation from a state-run communist economy into a market-based economy. That's the experience other nations are interested in. You have, with difficulties in Lithuania, a better relationship between the majority Lithuanians and the, and the minorities of Russians and Poles than many other nations with minorities. Uh, you may be interested in discussing with others how these have happened here and how it can happen other places. Remember that 
relationship between majority and minorities, different nations, different languages, different religions within the same territory is the main driver of conflict in the world. It's not to say that you, you cannot live together, but it's to say it provides politicians with the raw material for making conflict. Central African Republic, it was the Christians versus the Muslims. Uh, in Syria, it's now basically Shia Muslims and Christians on one side, Sunni Muslims on the other side. In Iraq, much of the same pattern. Southern Sudan, it's Nuers versus Dinkas, two tribes as we will define them. Uh, wherever you go where there are conflicts, it tends to be on an ethnic identity basis. So we need to be able to live together in nations uh, uh, of different identities. Um, as I may have said, I, I have been for the last 15 years involved in the peace process in Sri Lanka. Uh, yesterday night I was with a group of Tamils, I mean it's a huge Tamil diaspora in Europe. The issue we discussed was largely identity. Can you be a Tamil and a Sri Lankan at the same time? Because if you ask Tamils in Europe uh, where they come from, they will tend to say I'm a Tamil rather than I'm a Sri Lankan. So what I told them was that if you go to neighboring India, which is a huge success story, the many Tamils in India, they will all say, I'm a Tamil, and then I'm an Indian. I can for sure be both. I mean, my mother tongue is Tamil, and my mother tongue is not Hindi or any other language. My mother tongue is Tamil. I'm a Hindu by religion. I'm an Indian by nationality. You can have double, triple identities. Uh, if you have a wor world where you can have just one identity, you are only Norwegian, or you are only Lithuanian, or you are only Christian, uh, you have huge difficulties. Because everywhere in the world there are different identities competing, and you must be able to encompass different identities. So I will suggest this is also an area where you can provide some, some guidance, some interesting points to the world. And remember, we are at a point where every nation in the world ha have something to share with others. And every nation in the world can learn from the experience of others. I mean, if some, if some policy has worked in the United States of America, in Belgium and in China, it's highly likely that it will work also in Lithuania. Not necessarily certain, maybe you have to adopt it, but it's much more likely that it will work than something which has been a failure in the United States or Belgium or China. So let's learn from each other and let's share experience uh, on the basis to be more developed more rapidly and, and for sure to provide p uh, peace. And you have a lot to offer and we will welcome you in as soon as you are ready. There is no minimum uh, financial obligations and there are a couple of other members which are at the same level as you. Uh, but for sure, uh, uh, when you come in there, we will encourage you to do more, that's clear. But, but uh, you, are, you, are, you, are not, uh, you are at the same level as some of the other Central European nations. Uh, at the top of the ladder, the, the nation providing the biggest percentage of the, its GDP per capita uh, for development. Anyone know who that is? I bet that no one can give the right answer. That's the United Arab Emirates. It's not what most people think, like Sweden or something like that. It's Emirates is number one. They are now at 1.2% of the GDP for development assistance. And there are a number of other success stories also. But there are also a number of nations I mean, uh, which are more or less at the same level as, as Lithuania. And we welcome everyone. So please come. I'm sorry. As we are running out of time... <laughs> Before I invite coffee, I just would like to, on behalf of the Institute of International Relations, once more to thank Mr. Solheim for this informative and very inspiring lecture. And also, I would like to thank uh, Kapuczynski Lecture Series, who made it all possible to have Eric here, especially Katarzyna Czaplitska, who helped us to organize on the side of a lecture series. Kate, would you like to say a last word? Thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed, I totally agree that it was a very interesting lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, uh, once again for joining us uh, for the Kapuscinski Development Lectures uh, to this afternoon here in Vilnius. And I think it's uh, 
very important that we talk about the future of development cooperation in one of the um, countries which joined uh, the club of donors uh, quite recently. Um, I'm from Poland. Uh, I'm also uh, from one of these uh, these countries where we still where we are still not very much sure where we are. If we feel more donors or we feel still more like a country who should uh, receive a donation from the more from the more developed countries. So we are like in between. And I think um, there is also a huge place for media. There was a gentleman who, who mentioned the role of media and understanding of the of the of the international development processes, also in eastern part of Europe. We always think that we are so much behind Western Europe that uh, we are not really sure if we shall donate money, if we shall participate in development cooperation and how to position ourselves. So I guess uh, this, this kind of discussion here is, uh, is very, uh, very important. So thank you very much, uh, Rick, once again for uh, sharing with us your thoughts uh, about uh, also the uh, role of the so-called not so but still new uh, member states in development cooperation. Um, I would like to uh, say a big thank you to, uh, to, to Maria and to Vilis, who helped us a lot to organize, uh, to organize uh, this afternoon's lecture. Um, as uh, it was already mentioned, uh, we've been doing it for the last six years. Uh, we have organized uh, so far over 70 lectures, uh, mainly in Europe, but not only, not only also in Africa and uh, United States of America. Uh, and uh, we strongly believe that this is a like, great opportunity to bring uh, top world thinkers, uh, academics, uh, politicians, experts and specialists to the universities because the universities are main partners of the European Commission in, in, and UNDP in this initiative and we strongly believe that the universities are the best places uh, also to come up with new ideas and to discuss these new ideas and to bring some fresh thought and new spirit to development cooperation um, as, a, as a policy. Uh, as an international policy and uh, so thank you very much also for sharing uh, sharing your questions and your thoughts uh, I'm talking to the audience here uh, in Vilnius and sharing this with uh, with Eric because I think it's quite important also Eric if I may say for you to hear what the future uh, future politicians maybe think about development cooperation thank you very much for this afternoon um, goodbye So just a reminder that we have a 15-minute break and when all those interested in Lithuania's road to OECD come back to the discussion later on in 15 minutes. The coffee is served uh, at the back of this hall.